Well, let's uh, let's get back to to gas chromatography. Mass spectrometry is going to sneak in here a little bit also because uh, basically it is a good detector. You, it's uh, if you go down in our lab, you'll find every uh, mass spectrometer is hooked up either to a gas chromatograph or to liquid chromatograph. Basically, the chromatograph does your separation and feeds them you know, kind of one by one theoretically <laughs> into uh, into the mass spectrometer. So it's a it's kind of a match uh, made in made in heaven when it comes right down to it. And it's, it's kind of fun in the sense that uh, you'll see something up there. It's in selective and quantify compound without separation. You may have two components that aren't separated by the gas chromatograph, but the mass pressure, he, that will do the separation for you. So it, like I say, is really a, a, good, a good technique. I'm going to give an example of quantification without separ separation. And so if, if you take a look at the chromatogram up here, um, what we, we see is this little segment right in here is taken and enlarged up here. And in fact, we're just going to take a look at this part of that. And so this was one of, one of these up here. And so this is what the GC gives us. It gives us a, a peak that looks like that. Maybe it isn't the best chromatography, the best shape uh, of, the, of this uh, orange peak up here. But that, in fact, is made up of two compounds. And if you, you look at the peaks. When you run gas chromatography, you look for symmetry. And if you see symmetry, you think, OK, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. So this is just a little bit off. It might kind of raise an eyebrow and say, is that really one compound? But the mass spectrometer goes ahead, and it's monitoring masses all the time. And there's one set of masses that move with one compound. There's another set of masses, molecular weights, that move with the other compound that's in here. So in fact, what you get appears is some of these two. And that basically tells you that there's a there's something something different there because the, the masses also differ by just an extremely small amount of time because the peak loops just after the other one. So you kind of use this uh this system. And it didn't move. Okay. So we got the, the next one is here, and this goes ahead and then shows you the, the mass spectra of this compound, because it, like I say, these, these masses are just fractions of a second off. And so this monitors everything that's fractured a second later. This monitors or measures everything that's just, you know, eluding first. And so you actually get two spectra. Mass spectrometer is smart enough to do that. Let's put these all together. And this is what we're looking for. It puts these all together, and this is what you're looking for. So you're looking for two different compounds in the in the system. And I guess that's what I I wanted to show because then they can do the identification. You can actually do quantification of these these two compounds without separation. And uh, you know, it's, it's, aesthetically, you always like to get separation, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And so you, you kind of live with this, and it's it's a really pretty decent solution to the whole thing, and that would be possible without the mass spectrometer, that particular detector. And so, the idea is uh, separation. That's our purpose of of chromatography. And so, we're going to spend a, a little bit of time on how how that relates to gas chromatography. So, improving separation. What what factors give you resolution? How do you control them? So kind of look at the uh, above us. We have uh, selectivity. So R over there is a measure of resolving power. So that's our term for res resolution. But that's equal to our various factors. There's okay, mathematical, so much for that. And so this is selectivity. That relates to the phase itself. And so the selective nature of the phase. And so this term comes from this, what we get from stationary phase interaction. This is basically relates to the broadening of peaks in the system. So it goes more that direction. So you can get, get some information here. And so how do we make this better? We basically will work to improve all three of these terms to get better separation. 
in the mass spectrometer, or I should say gas chromatograph. We're done with the MS for a moment. And so we've got two different uh, terms that are used to measure the column performance. Uh, is this a good column? Is it a bad column? If you walk down in the laboratory, you'll probably find 50 columns laying around one place or another in boxes and <laughs> whatever. And so if you may be interested, can I use any of these? What kind of shape are they? Are? You start looking for these terms. You can run a, run a sample and basically look at the terms and get an evaluation of the quality of, of that uh, a particular column. So our two methods of expressing column performance, one's efficiency. And in that case, we're looking for, it says plates per meter, that's equivalent, this is weird, to distillations per meter of column. That, so each time you distill something, you get a little more pure, a little more pure, a little more pure. And that's basically what's happening is column. Your analyte's moving through, it dissolves in the phase, it distills back out, it moves in the phase, it comes back out. So you can kind of conceive that separation is occurring as a, a series of distillations. The more distillations, the higher the plate number is what we would call it, the better the separation is. The other one gets a, a factor of, of how much column does it take to get that one unit of separation. And so if it takes a lot, a large length of column, maybe several uh, centimeters, okay, that's not gonna be efficient because you don't get a lot of separations. So basically the two terms we look at are number one efficiency up there, and then the HETP or the distillations per column. You're not gonna lay awake worrying about these terms. <laughs> so if you look at it and say, huh? <laughs> don't, don't be too troubled by that. We do want to maximize efficiency though. The, the better our efficiency, the happier we are. So how do we get good efficiency or improved efficiency in gas chromatography? Well, a really important one is the size of that column. You've got this, you, you haven't seen the columns yet, have you? In, in lab or that? You do have seen them? Okay. Because that's a, a, a very small column that says, that millimeters, 0.1 millimeter diameter. Okay, that's pretty darn small column, uh, 0.7 by five. So this is our range. A small diameter tends to be much more efficient. This is efficiency. So small diameter column, extremely high efficiency. As we go to larger and larger columns, you basically uh, lose that efficiency. You don't get as many distillations. You don't get the same contact in a big column as you would in, in a small column. And so if we really need to be a, doing a separation, we like to use a small diameter column. But if you go down to the lab again, you'd find uh, several different sizes, uh, both very, very small, like 0.1 millimeter, uh, up to the 0.75. It kind of depends upon what you're doing. As you have smaller and smaller columns that handle smaller and smaller amounts of materials, which then hurts a little in sensitivity. So, the idea of a larger column, little sense better sensitivity, but poor separation. So a trade-off. So uh, another term that enters into so column diameter, you want separation, use a small diameter column. If you're interested in again improving your separation, you want a small number here, height equivalent per theoretical plate. How much length of a column does it take for me to get one unit separation? So the smaller that is, the more distillations, the better your separation. So we want HETP small. And so what uh, is a factor that influences your HETP? It's your carrier gas, that mobile thing. It's what's going through that, that column. And so if you kind of look at how the separation, like nitrogen is a carrier gas, a mobile phase, if we would uh, put that into our column and we start increasing its velocity, looking at the HETP, we want this to be minimum. We would find there's a minimum around 10, 12 centimeters per second. And so this would be a very sharp curve. It's fairly low, but it's sharp. As you go to higher and higher velocities, what you find is you can get to poor and poor separation. So, this type of mobile phase, nitrogen, is really, really good at very low speeds. 
well, if you want to sit there and wait, wait, wait forever, you shouldn't get good chromatography. You say, no, no, come on. But I want to see this going a little faster. And so you start saying, well, forget this, because if I go faster, I lose the separation. So what do we find here? Hydrogen and helium. The hydrogen is actually better than, than helium in this sense. So we get really good separation at extremely high flow rates through that system, linear velocities. If that's whizzing through there at 80, uh, is that seven meters per second, average linear velocity, what you'll find is you get separation very quickly. So this gives you short run times, quick analyses, good efficiency. This gives you not good efficiency, but really bulky. It takes forever. Good system runs fast, good, good data quickly. So we like to, well, traditionally we use helium, but now everybody uses hydrogen, as I mentioned, just because of the cost of, uh, of helium. They could actually stay with hydrogen and forget the cost thing. Everybody used to run helium because I think they were afraid about it burning or blowing up or something with hydrogen, which doesn't make much sense. So uh, another factor is the thickness of the coating inside that column. And I think you can kind of imagine that if you've got a column and there's a coating on the inside, you want those analytes to kind of dissolve in it and come back out and dissolve and come out back out. If you have a thick coating, your analytes can go in, oh, here it is. Oh, I think I'll go in further. I'll go in further. <laughs> and so with thick films, you don't get a quick in and out. They're very long, and that starts dragging one compound closer to another. So you want a, a really thin film. Down on the bottom, there's this thin phase. Less capacity means you can't put a lot of material on it. You got to have really small sample sizes. But you're going to get the best separation. So we've got several factors that come in here that say or give you a direction on what type of column, how thick a phase, the diameter, the mobile phase, and so on. What's important to you? Getting a lot of material on there so it can maybe feed some other instrument, or if you just want a good GC, you run for all of these as being, being optimum. Column length means better separations too. And so if you look at columns down in the lab, we probably have something as small as five meters, maybe. And I'm expecting we have something over 50 meters. Think about 50 meters of coiled, <laughs> coiled glass in, in the column. And so as you'd expect, again, you get more in and out of the phase, more distillations on a long column. They're more efficient. But they kill you in terms of time again. If the column's twice as long, it takes you twice as long to get your results. Okay, so if I want better efficiency, do I want to have a longer column? No, because it costs me time and money. I'm going to work with the mobile phase. I'm going to work with the size of the column and so on. So again, um, you kind of pay attention to these things simply because uh, they are money or they translate simply to, to money, the cost of analysis. This is kind of a, a pyramid showing each of these uh, different factors, the capacity, the speed, the sensitivity, the resolution, and so on. And they are all on this kind of a pyramid because they are at opposites depends on each other. If you want uh, speed, you're going to suffer in terms of ability to resolve you know, peaks. Your sensitivity is going to be cost and your capacity is going to be cost. So what, what do you need? Speed? You have a heck of a difficult uh, separation to do it. No, forget it. You're not going to get a lot of these other terms. So you, you kind of keep in mind that what's most important to you. And for the most part, we, we generally just take a, a middle of the road. How's that? Because we don't know what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And those columns are expensive, a few hundred dollars per, per column. So you could go less the middle of the road. You don't go in any ex extreme. And uh, those make up the columns that you, you lie. The next uh, section is a little bit of troubleshooting. Not, of course, that you have trouble, but if, if it would happen, a um, little bit of uh, troubleshooting in, information when they approach it. Uh, approximately 80% of all GC trouble is due to the failure of the mobile phase that carry gas going the right pathway. <laughs> That, that may sound kind of uh, strange, but basically you get leaks in the system. Something just wasn't put together properly. So 
that falls in in the category of um I got I was going to say in terms of uh well no let's forget it <laughs> plumbers that make good GC repair people Let, let's put it that way you want to keep things flowing in the right way through the right pipes okay that's exceedingly important to you and 80 percent of your problem is that gas leaking someplace not going where you thought it was or maybe not uh, even going in the, the right place 10% is uh, you screwed up, <laughs> operator error. And so you simply made some wrong setup in, in the system. And so that's 10%. Uh, 10% of trouble is due to the hardware, the GC itself. And um, th that's probably pretty reasonable at 80, 10, 10 in terms of what, what happens in our lab. The GCs are really durable pieces of equipment. They they hang in there well. They take abuse really well, um, but we can we can screw things up if we work at it, and that's that gets into the eighty percent category. What do you do to kind of make sure you're getting good data out of the system? Basically, you should have some kind of a quality control blend. You should have some materials put in a solvent. You know, they're the materials that should be in that solvent but the ones you want to separate in, in your analysis. And so you have a known system, known concentration, make an injection. Is it look like last time you ran the machine? And so basically run run an instrument check sample on occasion, have them around, they're, they're convenient. You feel much more comfortable at the end. You don't want to spend a lot of time analyzing things and find out the garbage afterwards. So again, run, get up a uh, set of standards uh, available and simply run them. The uh, pneumatic components of uh, the GC basically are flow controllers, our, our gas sources, our flow controllers. They are precision instruments. Um, you can buy some of the equipment that we we might use from the, the local hardware store. You can go down to your gas supplier and you can pick up regulators and uh, you know you uh, typing piping tubing and so on. Uh, you don't do it. <laughs> you buy. You pay the money that they want for these pieces of equipment because they are precision made. They are really fussy. And so keep in mind they may look like something at the welding shop, <laughs> but they're not. And uh, but basically they they contaminate your carrier gas, your mobile phase, and you end up with peaks you didn't really expect. And so. Very, very, very important. The remaining uh, percentage, operator error. Whoops, we screwed up. <laughs> How do we keep from screwing up? Again, having uh, that uh, sample, uh, you know, standard sample that you run. You maybe start of the day someplace in the day if it turns out that you're running a, a lot of samples. So anyway, just kind of looking at having... Uh, reference samples that you can run in your instrument to make sure it's it's okay. Hardware failure doesn't happen often. Those things are pretty darn durable. Um, they're durable, robust, and uh, they have a long lifetime. You might find some gas chromatographs down in our lab that are 40 years old. And guess what? They're as good as the ones built today. Gas chromatography was mature <laughs> 30, 40 years ago. And there's nothing once you get to, you know, this is the, the maximum, you've reached the ideal conditions. Uh, it's not going to get better over time. They may put more fancy lights. <laughs> they may make more sophisticated programs for you. But again, they're really no better than they, than they were 30 years ago. And so, you know, hardware failure doesn't happen often. But again, you have, that's why you have your, your sample, your standard sample you run. Does it give you the results that you want? There's a comment here about having corrective maintenance repairs done by trained professionals. That's that's, that's probably wise. Um, but again, you look at what it costs uh, to get a repairman in. Uh, you're not so bad uh, about asking one of you guys, hey, hey, what do you think's wrong with this? Is this working right? Do you have a friend <laughs> that could stop by? And uh, actually, well, we do have a couple friends that worked at uh, Hewlett Packard, now Agilent, uh, for much of their time. Both one uh, rebuilds and sells mass spectrometers on the on the side. He's retired. The other one's retired, and he did the GCs. 
So when we've got trouble, what we do is we either call John Kroska or John Freeberg and say, hey, would you like to stop over? I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> And you know, and if you build up a relationship with people, which which you do, not to take advantage of them, but, but because of friendship and what I guess normal normal business, and so we get our gas schematographs, we get our mass spectrometers fixed free, and boy, when you start thinking about uh, service calls today, that's that's really really important. So this is um, the, the flow system that's in a, in a gas chromatograph. Basically, I'll get out here a little bit again. So we basically have our, our gas cylinder over here. There is a flow controller. And these, these things are sensitive. You never shut them off. You bring them down so they don't get the flow. If you tie, tighten them, it in fact will do a lot of damage up here. So okay, you make an adjustment here. This is something like 54 milliliters per minute comes into your injection port. This is where you take a syringe, put your sample down here. It goes poof because it's hot and it gets carried on. So 54 mils per minute coming in is an example. Some of that just goes right here and goes right out into the room. So a small percentage of that gas coming in comes across here. Why does it come across here? Because this is where you have a rubber septum. It's not rubber, but it's a polymer septum. And that polymer septum may be held 250, 300 degrees centigrade. And as it sits at 250, 300 degrees centigrade up here, it's going to give up some of the fall of the compounds. It's going to be close. And you don't want those decomposition products going down here into your run. You want this to come and flush it off and get, get rid of it. And then a small, well, the remainder of that would be roughly 50 mils per minute. Comes down here, so our, our glass area, and only one of that 50 comes here and goes through the column and out. The rest of it goes simply out of that, a sliver. It permits you to take a one microliter syringe and make an injection and not flood the whole darn instrument. It just spits out 50 parts out of 51 into the room. The one part is right about ideal concentration for you to get good separation and good analysis. And so every system is set up with this kind of a splitter. There's little different arrangements of them, but they will all have some way of reducing that gas flow and sample um, so that the instrument can manage it better. Where do you find problems? Um, well, that septum on top, that is, like I say, a polymer material. If you don't change that every day or two, it depends on how much you're, you're running your samples, that's going to decompose some. It's going to be giving up volatiles. And guess what? They're going to be accumulating in your system, accumulating a pollen as well. So you always start your day with a nice fresh septum. So it can be compared. There's also a um, um, oh, gasket, oh, well, O-ring, I'll get it right yet. Um, I say rubber, but it's a polymer O-ring that goes up here, because this is glass. And this glass, it connects to metal. And so we've got an O-ring up here that kind of gets squashed up. And so it can come down, down this direction. And so you can have a leak up here. So you can have a holy septum. You can have a leak at this point. And this now is that tiny column that comes up here and gets stuck up about into about this point. And so you've also got then a seal here. So you have really a seal up here, a seal here, and a seal here. And any one of those places, you know, must be looked after. You must uh, change them um, fairly often, meaning depends on how many samples, maybe every 30 samples. You want to go ahead and take, take a look at those and replay, replace them. There is a, a splitless valve on the end that isn't a problem to us, but it's a, a flow, just basically a flow controller. So if you got gas coming in here, we're gonna get this 51 mils per minute coming down here, one mil goes here, 50 mils goes here. How do we set what comes out here? We set it by controlling this valve, so it's a back pressure valve. It doesn't really do much except like I say, what percentage or what proportion of this 51 mils gets pushed into here. 
and what part goes out this direction. So it is a setting that you you do make in the instrument. Perch line, we don't worry about that. So basically applications, um, you might see people doing headspace analysis down the lab. You may be looking at oxidation of some powder or some product that you've made. You may simply put that into a closed flask with a, a lid on it that have a septum in it. And you can put that into an oven, maybe 50 degrees centigrade, come back in 30 minutes to an hour, take a, a gas tight syringe and drop one or two mils and go into the GC. And so, that's pretty easy sample preparation. You're just going to draw some of the sample air or nitrogen, whatever you flush your, your sample with. Just sample that, run it through the GC, and look for something like oxidation products. Does my product oxidize? Has it changed in any way? Good way to, to look at it. Really, really, really simple way of, of getting your analysis. If uh, other than headspace, we have to go to some other technique. We we can't stuff a you know a little bit of protein isolate into the injection port and hope something happens good. And so we've got to one way or another. We've we've got to go ahead and get the compounds you want to measure out of your sample into a form that will go into the instrument. And so you end up having a, a number of different ways of preparing sample for a. Uh, gas schematic graphic analysis. And that's what we'll spend a, a little bit of time with. So what I mentioned to you is called static headspace. It's equilibrium headspace. You have your sample closed in a, a glass container. Like I say, you have a septum on top. And you simply sample it. And so that's uh, what we call static headspace, equilibrium headspace. But then there's there's more methodologies to that that are still equilibrium methods. Um, you can, well, let's let's go to SPEMI. SPEMI is solid phase micro extraction. That's uh, probably the favorite uh, of uh, Fernanda uh, in terms of what she she likes to do. And I'll go kind of through each of these as we get go along for time here. So static in space, you just take a sample. If we look at other techniques, we can start saying, let's uh, put something in there. Let's concentrate the headspace in some way. And uh, one way is, is what we call speeding, like I said, I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. We, we can, but that's that's still an equilibrium technique. Your sample comes to equilibrium, you put something in to absorb it and go out. So that's still an equilibrium. But there is also dynamic systems where you'll take and put a purge gas. You might have some protein in samples. You can bubble the gas through that protein sample. Could be a liquid, could be a solid powder, could be whatever. But you're going to actually purge your sample with this inert gas. And you're going to collect whatever comes off that sample in concentrate on a material called 10x or a slightly different version of, of swinging down here. So there's uh, a lot that goes into this beginning. How do you get samples in the system? You can, so we can do gases. We can use uh, liquid. We can use syringes. We can do other, other approaches. So a lot of methodologies and of uh, the methodologies that you got, probably the GC is the least problem. It's is getting a sample to the GC or you know in the GC. Let's let's put it that way. And so this is like I say, um, Fernando's favorite uh, solid phase micro extraction. This is basically a, a system where you've got some kind of a well. Let's let's do this one. We've got a, a plunger up here that can connected to a very, very fine tube in the center. This fine tube in the center is coated with an absorbent, high temperature, stable absorbent. But this is set up so you can kind of put this out into your sample and you can draw it in for protection um, that doesn't get broken in kind of a damage. So it's uh, called solid phase micro extraction. It's rapid. You take it, you've got your, your sample at equilibrium, 
So if we put it down through a, a septum, so it's closed up, expose that needle, let that needle absorb organic volatile materials, whatever you're looking for, draw it back up, put it into a gas cardiograph, push it down, again, the plunge it down now, so you're putting that absorbent into the heat, it resorbs and it goes into gas cardiograph and then you get, get your data. It's, a, it's really a, a rapid method. It's simple, a uh, broad range of compounds that you, know, you can absorb, you can do in this manner. It's a low cost. It's uh, really, I say, it's not just a favor for good reason. It's it's very sensitive and it's very economical. And that's what you said. What does the C P P S stand for? This is what? The C P P S stand for the broad range of Your probe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, I, you got the answer? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, the, the cons of this is it's a very small amount of extracting phase. You know, this is a tiny uh, syringe, and you don't have much exposure, you don't have much absorbent on there. Yeah. And so, but uh, it tends to be limited in, in that sense. It's easy to overload it. Um, or it's easy to not get enough material absorbed on this little tip down here. And so um, it's good. It, when it works, it's a nice way to do it. Again, you know, simply preparing your sample, stuffing this little needle down there and exposing it for time and putting it in gas chromatograph is a pretty, pretty simple way to go. When you, when you can go that direction, it's really a good direction to go. The biggest problem we have with it is sensitivity. It doesn't have much absorbent. It doesn't collect a great deal. So you've got to have a fairly decent amount of material to get to measure and, and get a picture. And so alternatives is called a purge and trap. And it is as it sounds. Um, you can have a, a nitrogen gas coming in here, bubble through your sample, so you just could be a, again a protein, protein powder, protein isolate. It could be anything that's uh, preferably uh, dissolvable, dispersible. So you can kind of take this gas and bubble it through the sample. As the gas comes up, it's going to take volatiles with it. So it will dissolve into the gas. That goes into a trap. And that trap is typically something like that long. It's about the size of a pencil, actually. And so this trap has a lot of capacity, a lot of surface. Steamy, tiny, tiny, tiny. This is literally a ton of <laughs> absorbent up there. And so if you're looking for analytes of very, very low concentration, you can put a lot more you know, up here to, to measure that. And so what you do in that case is you simply go ahead and purge 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you want, take the trap out, Put it down here, put your carrier gas from your gas chromatograph, your mass spectrometer through the trap, heat that trap so we can blow everything off it, and that blows right into a gas chromatograph, into a full mass spectrometer or into a column. So virgin traps, same, same principle, a dynamic headspace methodology. It just uh, has more capacity. There's all kinds of ways to get samples in here, <laughs> as you'll see. Uh, this is uh, a twister. That's a trade name, obviously. It doesn't really twist by itself. And so this is now a glass piece that has a coating on it. So that glass is coated. It could be Teflon too, but so we've got a coating on here, different absorbance. You can go ahead and uh, have your sample. Maybe we're looking at whether Coca Cola really gave you what the we're going to give us in terms of all the compounds and flavor compounds. You can take a some coke, pour it into a beaker, drop this in the stir bar, have a stir bar, uh, simply stirring in the coke as long as you want. Pull that out, rinse it off, and basically put that directly into uh, this is actually designed gas chromatograph injection point. So normally we put a needle through here. We're going <laughs> to drop this into it. And have it resorbed and go into your gas chromatograph and solve the problem. You can't have fat in the sample. That's the biggest problem because it leaks. Um, 
these tend to be very nonpolar. That's their purpose. They are really nonpolar materials. And if you have any fat in your sample, guess where it's going to go? It's going to like it there. And then you put that into the gas chromatograph, and now your fat is given up in your gas chromatograph, and that gets ugly. And so, you know, nice if um, you have liquids, no fat in the sample. A good way to go. Fairly high capacity. There's numerous other other ways to do this. Um, each of them have kind of have their their pros and cons. Um, you comment to choose a method wisely. Yeah, you, know, you think you think about it. Is there fat in the sample? Isn't there fat in the sample? Is there? Am I going to be looking at trace compounds? Are they volatile compounds that will actually go into the headspace? You know, if you think about putting your sample into water, closing up a vial and sticking a spemi in there, and if those things aren't volatile, <laughs> they're very low volatility, they're not going to be migrating up to that, that trap. And so you have to think about what you're doing and, and why you're doing. And uh, the new edition of the te course text, of course, I assume you're all reading that night to keep you alive and well and happy and entertained. Um, as an expansion of that uh, particular section, uh, mm -hmm. because sample prep is really important. Again, if you do a poor job of sample prep, you don't, you're not going to get any good results. The machine isn't going to correct you know, what what you do. So, be really familiar with what you're doing and and why you're why you're doing it. These are some uh, examples of uh, applications. Um, oh, oh, monitoring oxidation of plant protein isolates. I wonder how that got in there. Anyway, uh, there might be some uh, lipid left in your, your isolate in, in one way or another. And you want to know, is this oxidized in your preparation? Is it oxidized uh, you know, later on, whatever, for storage? Again, how might you look at uh, that protein isolate and say, is, it, is the fat in there, is it oxidized? And so place a sample in a glass vessel seal it in a nice uh, new polymer septum, and the internal standard. We do a lot with internal standards. You know, we put uh, a sample in, we put a standard into the flask, into the liquid, whatever. That, that takes care of some of these things that might go wrong elsewhere. Not everything's the same. It happens to the internal standard as well. So we're, we use internal standards in almost every thing we do. Equilibrate, so put your sample in the in a vessel. It could be with water, it could be just simply dry. You could chop up your protein isolate and uh, in humps, put it into a closed vessel. And so maybe incubate for 60 degrees centigrade for that matter. Draw on a sample of the headspace, and you can literally do a fringe, you know, one, two, three, five mils of headspace and put it into a, a mass or GC and, and get your measurement. So simple, quick way to do it. Um, you might be looking for hexanal. Hexanal is a very common marker of liquid oxidation. And so you kind of look at the, how much hexanal, what's the area of hexanal peak that you see? What's the area of your internal standard? So you can always match, match that. So the internal standard is certainly really important. And when you get your data, you don't ever accept it. It's, it's great. You don't assume it's great. You assume it's wrong. <laughs> and, and you look at every step of it on that. And you, and you, get your data. you look at it. That thing just draws a chromatogram for you. It changes peaks. It, you look at it. Because some peaks may look like, oh, maybe that's a double. Oh, well, okay. What would it matter? So, again, you don't trust anything when it comes right down to it without, without looking at it. And this is certainly no exception. Look for peak wall, peak size, peak resolution, shape. It, uh, it certainly is a, a simple way, and it is a simple way to go. But there are also problems that come along with it. You're going to be doing a, a headspace, and that means you have a fairly large syringe. It might be two mils, might be five mils. That needle has a fairly decent size to it. And as you push that needle down to you know, sample the air, well, your sample, you're going to be chewing up that septum, and the septum is going to leak at some point. Again, you keep things looked after. Septum leakage with time. Um, these are big syringe needles that carry that gas, and they're not big, I have to say. It's, you know, 
about the size of a well, small lead pencil. I was that a small lead for the pencil. Um, it's a dry sample. Uh, does the formed with of oxidation uh, products, do they migrate out of the flower? If it's a solid sample, do they migrate out into the headspace? Do you take sample it? Do you have to take that material and blend it? Do you make a slurry of your uh, product? Do you can free down the structure? Or do you simply hope that it's going to transfer through when you're lining the oxide or whatever oxide with an oxidation migrates? Should the sample be dissolved in water to free? That's now if you're monitoring that. Uh, if your sample varies, if there's a good fat content, headspace will also reflect, will not accurately reflect um, your amount of material. That's, that's always a problem. Fat messes us up. Fat loves volatile compounds. And so um, most of what we do are work with lipophilic materials. If you would have a, a powder that's got no fat, you've got the same powder with 1% fat, you get very, very different results. The flavors want to stay with that 1% fat. So you kind of keep, keep some of those things in mind as, as well. Uh, the method of analysis, method of sample preparation, understanding is important. The idea is, does hexanal, does the internal standard react with the protein? <laughs> hexanal, okay, that's an aldehyde. What happens if your internal standard reacts with your sample? Uh, okay, not, not a good choice. What if there is surface oil? So I'm still thinking about that powder, the protein powder. If there's surface oil on there, a lipid of one kind or another, it'll have a higher rate of oxidation than the product itself. If it things inside of the powder, they're protected to a fair extent. Any oil on the surface is going to be very, very prone to oxidation. So if you do a headspace, and it's a dry head space, you're monitoring what's in surface. You dissolve it, measuring what's throughout the particle. Um, basically, it requires a good deal of thought as to what's going on. Um, applications, aroma research, there's just all kinds of examples. Uh, it's a, such a common tool in terms of, of research. So if I want to take a look at these. Okay, residual diphenylamine on apples. Hmm. So how would we how would we measure uh, this treatment that's given apples? Treat them prior to storage to control apple scald. So it's fairly common. You've got one kilogram of diphenylamine per kilogram of uh, water aqueous solution. And we're concerned about the residue of the, on the apple at the time of consumption. So we'd like to have that gone or we'd like to have somebody wash off that apple, <laughs> but it's put on there for a purpose. And there is a, what, an FDA permit of 10 parts per million in, in some, some places, some, some countries. So how do we use gas chromatography, uh, mass spectrometry to determine the amount of residual preservative, if we want to call it that, on fresh apples? And this is um, kind of it's not a difficult one in the sense that uh, it's put on the surface. And so everything you're going to want to measure is on the surface. So you can go ahead and simply wash the surface with a solvent, soak it three minutes or something, put the apple <laughs> in a container with some hexane, and then go ahead and you take that liquid, that solvent that hopefully dissolved your, your uh, preservative, uh, concentrated for GCMS. So we, what we'd we do it, we'd probably take that, that liquid, whether it's hexane that we wash the apple with, take that hexane and probably just evaporate it. We, we'd simply put it under the fume hood, have a slow flow of nitrogen gas, so it's non-oxidizing. We'll basically evaporate the hexane. And uh, the compound we're measuring is a purely high boiling point. It's not gonna evaporate. So we'll concentrate the sample for analysis then end up injecting it. And this is actually from the surface of an apple, if you've ever, ever wondered. Okay. Um, a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting things here. But we're only interested in quality assurance or the safety of this particular preservative being uh, residual on the apple and what people eat. So again, we hook this uh, system up, a gas chromatograph to a mass spectrometer. And we're interested in now looking for the diphenylamine. Is, is there a diphenylamine in the hexane that we use to wash 
that apple. And so this is what the, the mass spectrum looks like. And so the mass spec is at the end of the GC. It's probably taking a spectrum maybe 100 times a second. And so it's getting that picture 100 times per second. It is at some point as that compound eludes from the GC, we're going to get the mass spectrometer up and down in terms of this profile. So we know what the profile looks like. We run a standard of the uh, diphenylamine. And we start then looking for this spectrum in uh, the analysis, GC analysis. You don't have to actually look at all of the peaks that are uh, that we saw on this on this previous one, the previous one. We can simply set the mass spectrometer to look only for things that have a mass of 169. And so that is the, the, the primary peak of that particular preservative. And so our mass spectrometer is just kind of continuously monitoring this one mass. And then we've got a blank. So we take uh, our solvents, we concentrate our solvent that we would use to extract the surface of the apple. We make injection. Oh, good. Nothing 169 there. Nothing is in our, our reagents and our system that's going to screw us up. This is uh, a counter spike or over spike. So we actually have this uh, peak right here is the, the one of them. This is our, that's our diphenylamine. So this is the one we're interested in. That's, uh, who knows, that's something else with a mass of 169. And we get this small peak here. And then if we spike it and take, and then we add that pure compound, that pesticide, the herbicide, whatever it is, to our solvent, we see this peak grow bigger. So good. This is what comes from the apple. This is that same extract that's been spiked with our known compound or standard. It's gotten bigger. We're happy with that is what we think it is. Fatty acid profile. Have you guys done this experiment? Okay. So you've, uh, and you were looking at fatty acids, I think, weren't you? Yeah. That, that's that's very common uh, application over the gas chromatograph too, looking at a uh, fatty acid profile. Needless to say, you just, well, you can run triglycerides. You don't necessarily have to hydrolyze off the, the fatty acids, but we normally do. So you get a fatty acid profile, you know, how much uh, C4, C6, C8, and so on down the line. So that's a uh, very, very common use, like I say, of the GC and like I say, GCMS. Uh, we must isolate uh, pure fat from the food one way or another. And so uh, we need to do, do that first. Uh, this is one, one system. What is it? Adding three mils of boron trifluoride, two drops of fat, cap with Teflon, put tube in boiling water one hour. Mm. That, that works. I'm not too impressed with that one. You should have got... Depends what you were running, you should have got something that looks like looks like this. Uh, so this is a, a standard run. And so we have each of our three fatty acids that give us a, a peak here. And we can run them as free acids or we can make a derivative of them to make them an ester. And making them an ester is a, it gives nicer chromatography. We get a nice sharp peak in making this derivative. So most commonly, you probably made methyl esters, I would think, or that. Yeah. And so you should have gotten something like this. If you look at a standard run, most, most foods don't have the uh, butyric, acrylic, acrylic acids. Most of the lipids end up being out here, 14, 16, 18, 18 1, 2, 3, and so on. And so it's a, a nice standard run. And this is the peaks that are removed at 3.258 minutes within a very, very small tolerance. So again, you just kind of look at this reference and then that can identify each of these peaks, what are those, those compounds. Already? Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I got about another half hour. I'm not staying until. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>
<laughs> I do like the tease. I don't know. Maybe if you notice that. No, I think we'll call it quits with it. Okay. This is very long. Okay. Mm -hmm.